Okay, this is um, lecture five in our imaging course, and today we're going to focus on sampling and uh, how the quality of the image is affected by uh, the frequency or the rate at which we sample uh, the image. We all live in a digital age at this point, and um, the difference between analog signals and digital signals are shown on this uh, simple diagram. If I have an analog signal, normally I have continuous floating point values as a function of position or independent variables, say x in space, and so this is a height or a wave as a function of x. I can make that signal digital by sampling that function at discrete points as a function of x and just recording the values. And so my signal now is not an infinite set of floating point numbers, it's a finite set of discrete values which are samples of that signal. And this is used in digital audio recording um, and in digital images for your, your camera. Brightness as a function of position in the camera is uh, given as a number, uh, height or brightness. Uh, a waveform of a sound wave instead of a continuous signal is given as a set of uh, integer values. And when you want to transmit that information, it's very convenient because all you have to do is transmit these values and then reconstruct the signal uh, from the transmitted values. Imaging, medical imaging, uh, operates in the digital world uh, and this image is 512 by 512 point estimates of brightness, or pixels. And um, as a function of position, this is a human chest. This is the you know, uh, front of the patient, or the anterior side. Then their chest wall is the heart, and the spine is down here. If we zoom in more closely, uh, we can see that under certain settings for how this image is displayed, you can start to see the discrete nature of the sampling of those of the brightness. In this case, this is a CT scan, so the brightness corresponds to the um, amount of X-ray attenuation at that point in the sample. If we zoom in further to this detail here, you can see that there is uh, the discreteness is, is quite visible at this point. Uh, this way of displaying the image um, shows basically an artifact. The object is not composed of discrete, sharp-edged boxes. This is just the way we're displaying those pixel values, but the spacing between the boxes gives you an idea of the sampling rate in samples per millimeter um, uh, for the spatial resolution of that image. Really, we shouldn't display the image uh, with these little boxes visible because there's no point in doing that. You should just uh, interpolate and display the image like this. We have many more pixels underlying uh, the object that you're visualizing, and you don't see those crazy little squares. Um, if we go back and look and plot through the discrete square values, and you can see as I'm plotting through this feature here, which is actually a little piece of calcium in a coronary artery, um, we have the discrete steps in its brightness as we pass through that. Those values themselves uh, can be used just to create a smooth uh, function that is probably a better illustration of what is uh, uh, in the underlying tissue. Um, Sampling in two dimensions, as we just saw here, uh, we, we characterize this mathematically with uh, a sampling rate or uh, basically a sampling uh, period. And so if I'm sampling in the x direction at a specific rate or period, delta x, I can visualize it like this, delta y, visualize it like this. You can see we're dramatically undersampled um, if all we you know, took from this sample were these points. Uh, we change our sampling rate by changing this value of uh, delta x, which is the separation between the sample points, the sampling cone. So if we're given a 2D 
continuous signal. So this is a function f of x, which is, you know, uh, a continuous function. Uh, what we want to do is generate a set of numbers, right? These are just uh, discrete numbers uh, that are indexed by m and m, such that when we look at that set of numbers, the relationship between those numbers and the function is the following, where the, this is the sampling period and m index, which, you know, how many steps across the, the function we're taking, and n is how many steps down vertically we're taking. Uh, and so we've replaced our continuous function, f of x, y, with these discrete samples of that function. Uh, so these are called the sampling periods, and one over the sampling period gives you the sampling frequency or sampling rate. And for you know temporal signals like music, uh, the sampling period is in you know milliseconds or microseconds, and the sampling rate is simply uh, frequencies like kilohertz or megahertz. For us, when we're looking at images, the sampling period is in millimeters and the sampling rate is in cycles per millimeter. So it's um, basically describing how many cycles of a sine wave do you have per millimeter is the sampling rate. Sampling rates show up uh, immediately uh, in simple descriptions of CT scanning because we're going to have an x-ray source that we raster across the patient who is sitting here and then there'll be a detector that measures the intensity of x-rays that get through our, our object. And the separation of these detectors just in millimeters is basically uh, one over that separation is the sampling rate uh, across here and you know as the geometry of the detector changes um, the details of that sampling rate might change but you know the basic principle is that there's a separation between this sample here and this sample here and usually that separation in a modern scanner is about one millimeter on the detector on that order um, so uh, you just count across the number of detectors and that's how many millimeters are in your field of view So in CT scanning, we have an x-ray source. It comes out of a small orifice and produces a fan beam of x-rays, and then here's our sampling grid. And so our sampling rate is going to be defined by how many sample points we have on that grid. This is what the sampling grid looks like, or the detector, the x-ray detector itself. It comes in component parts, but this is the theta direction, or if the patient was lying here, this would be the right-left direction. And uh, this is the z direction, or the direction from their head to their feet. Um, and inside each one of these modules, uh, we have a set of these little chips that have individual detectors on them, and they're uh, they detect an x-ray, cause a flash, goes to a photodiode, which makes a voltage coming out, and that set of signals comes out of each one of these you know, replicated chips. Uh, you can see it's plugged in here. This is where the electronic voltages come out. Here's the detector element itself. It's 16 detector elements this way, 32 this way, and they are uh, separated by about one millimeter. Um, question. Why can't you just make this thing 64 by you know 32? Just put 32 here and 64 along here to make a higher resolution picture. Uh, just as they seem to be doing endlessly with uh, cell phone cameras, they now are up to 12 megabyte or uh, megapixel cell phone cameras, which is a 3,000 by 4,000 array. Um, well. You can do that. You can just make uh, more cells. However, the efficiency of that detector may go down because there's space between each detector element. And also, you have to get a critical number of photons inside each detector element when you're measuring your signal um, in order to get good statistics. And so you just might run out of photons. Uh, so there's going to be a balance between uh, 
the photon flux you think you're going to use and the dimension of these uh, detectors. 256 detector elements this way, 832 this way when we're all said and done. So here's a continuous function as a function of an independent variable x, which is position in space, given in millimeters, and these are let's say x-ray intensities as a function of position in, in millimeters. In MR, this, if we're talking about sampling, this will be a function in time. We'll have a voltage as a function of time and uh, you'll measure those, you'll sample those voltages with an A to D converter. We want to turn this continuous signal, in our case for CT, it's a image that exists in space of, of x-rays that are flying through space with different intensities. And uh, we want to uh, essentially convert it to these discrete samples. Okay, so our continuous function sampled at n points, you know, at, at uh, an nth point of delta x gives us a sequence of values as opposed to a continuous function. So we have a big question. How many samples do we have to take? Like how finely do we have to sample this thing um, in order to have a high fidelity system, right? You can imagine if I sample very infrequently, I'm not really going to be able to tell you what this function is. So a more technical way of asking this question is, can we reconstruct the original continuous signal or the original continuous image from its discrete samples? So given just this sequence of numbers, this list of numbers, can I give you back this function? That's one way of asking that question. And then what are the consequences if you don't sample it well enough? If we undersample, uh, does it cause artifacts and what do they look like? So the example we will look at um, initially is a time domain sampling. And if we have this signal, which is a, say a voltage measured as a function of time, which is what we would measure in our receiver coil um, in an MRI experiment. And we look at the time base, this is 100 milliseconds here, uh, zeros here, and then we start oscillating voltage. Um, we're going to sample that voltage as a, that is a function of time at some rate, uh, capital FS. And uh, what we'll do is we'll take the Fourier transform, the 1D Fourier transform of this signal, time domain signal, to look at the amplitudes of the sines and cosines that are required to construct this signal uh, from those sinusoids. So when we look at those amplitudes, that's what the Fourier transform gives us, we plot that normally as uh, either an amplitude spectrum or a power spectrum. The power spectrum is just the amplitude of those uh, coefficients squared. And um, so this is in time, this is in hertz or cycles per second, right? So if I look at uh, an interval, say, from zero to 100 milliseconds, and I have 100 full cycles in there. That's one cycle per millisecond, so that's one kilohertz is the frequency component. So I come to my uh, Fourier spectrum and I say, okay, here's a kilohertz here, one kilohertz, and that would be the peak uh, at that frequency. You can see also that when, when we'll see this when we plot Fourier transforms of images, we often plot the relative intensity of a power spectrum or an amplitude spectrum as a logarithm because of the huge dynamic range of these values. And so here we're, our dynamic range is somewhere around one. And then as we go out to higher and higher frequencies, we get down to you know very small values, 10 to the minus six and below. So it's like one millionth of the amplitude here. Um, not to say that down at 10 to the minus six, 10 to the minus five, there's still important information out here often. But sometimes it can just turn into noise, right? Um, the point of this is, here's our continuous signal sampled at FS. If we take every eighth point 
of this signal. We undersample. We, we sample more slowly. Then the function looks like this. The sampled function looks like this. When we take its Fourier transform, the digital Fourier transform, the power spectrum looks like this. And that's quite different, obviously, than this. Uh, you can see that at around zero in the low frequencies, you know, the if, if you looked compared peak to peak, they're reasonably similar. But then as we get to higher frequencies, uh, basically something very strange happens in that the whole thing just repeats itself over and over. And so out to about 3 kilohertz, we have uh, this symmetric looking function around some center. And then the whole thing just repeats itself. And um, this is you know, what happens when you're undersampled uh, is that information that's out at higher frequency wraps back into the lower frequencies and you can only plot a finite bandwidth. And this bandwidth is entirely determined by the rate at which you're sampling this or the delta t of your samples over here. A visual way to look at that is if I have a sinusoid of this frequency, say this is x space in millimeters, and I sample that oscillating function as a function of, of position. Obviously, this top one is well sampled. You know, I can see the, the phase and the amplitude of the sinusoid quite well. If I drop, you know, that sampling by a factor of 20 or so, such that I get these samples, well, the function that I'm looking at now is a, a much lower frequency sinusoid. See, I, I don't have the ability to resolve this frequency at this sampling rate. So the amplitude at this frequency appears or folds back into this lower amplitude here. So here's an example um, of sampling rate and uh, aliasing. It's called the wagon wheel effect. And we'll play a video on... Uh, YouTube to take a look at this. This is a really interesting uh, video. I kind of like this thing. Uh, let's go out here and hope that it plays back well. Sorry about the music. Don't need that. So here you can see. As the camera is sampling pictures of the positions of this you know, object, you can see some of those rings are rotating clockwise, some are rotating counterclockwise, and some are stationary. And this is determined by the speed of the rotation of the ring and the sampling rate of the camera. If we went into slow motion, we would see something like this. We would see everybody rotating at the same rate. But when we're um, looking at it, whoop, too bad. Now he'll come back. But when we're looking at it at, say, 20 frames a second, uh, we see multiple different frequencies of rotation of these patterns. You can see some are clockwise and some are counterclockwise. And it's interesting to see where they stop. It looks like it's constant. And then this is the in slow motion. You can resolve, because the sampling rate is higher, you can resolve the actual uh, frequency of oscillation of those uh, different patterns. Okay, we'll go back to our slideshow here. So in medical imaging, here's an example of aliasing. If we have a film image, uh, say of a chest x-ray, and I want to archive that in my picture archiving system, as opposed to my filing system, I need to digitize it. And so a lot of scanners were developed where you just digitize this picture that's on the, on the left here. After that digitization, if the scanner is a cheap one and it doesn't digitize at a high enough rate, you get artifacts in the resulting image, which are these high frequencies, which are the aliasing of the high frequency information in this picture back into the lower frequencies that can be sampled with this digitizer. So one way to avoid these artifacts is to take this image, filter it such that the high frequency information is missing, and then digitize that, and you wind up with a clean image. It doesn't have this aliasing artifact, but 
it is a lower resolution picture in that it's blurrier than the original. Here's another example of an aliasing artifact in an image where we have two different cameras being tested and the fabric of this coat has a high frequency pattern due to the stitching. And this camera, you do not see that pattern. In this camera, the CCD image detector, the array of detector elements, is sampling at such a frequency combined with the optics uh, such that you get aliasing of this low spatial frequency pattern uh, on top of your image. And this is in fact aliasing of the power or the energy of the high frequency of the pattern back into the lower frequencies that are displayed and this and you get this artifact and it's called a moray pattern and it's an example of aliasing. So we're going to look at this mathematically and develop a couple of functions to help us do so. Uh, recall that the comb function is a set of delta functions arrayed on the x-axis in one dimension so it's a continuous functions of a continuous variable x. Um, if it's just comb x then we have delta functions at the integer values 1, 2, 3, 4 and minus 1 or 0, minus 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. And that can be written down quite simply as a sum of delta functions uh, whose uh, peak is shifted by uh, an integer number. It can be written down in two dimensions in a very similar way. And then uh, we can derive a function called the sampling function, uh, which is a close relative to the delta function, just by scaling where the, the um, non-zero values of the delta function fall. And so here I have the delta functions are sitting on the integers in the xy plane. Uh, in this case, I can have the delta function setting on, on a, a continuous grid uh, with a separation of m delta x and delta y. Uh, so every delta x, say every 0.1 centimeters, and every 0.1 centimeters, I can have a uh, sample spike, um, and I'll just count them out. Uh, with these integers m and n. Uh, and uh, the relation to the comb function of this sampling function is just this equation here, just by looking at the, the analytical form of the comb function. A uh, 1D version of the comb function looks like this. Again, it's just delta functions sitting on the the axis separated by uh, delta x. Um, and we're going to use this 1D comb function to generate an analytical function which we call the sampled version of f of x. And that's shown here where the basically the weights or the heights of these delta functions are provided by the values of uh, f of x at the discrete points uh, that are separated by delta x. Now to this point, this is our sampling function which is the, it's a continuous function in x. So it is not, it is not itself a sequence or a list of finite, a finite list of, of values uh, for digitizing our function. It's defined everywhere. Um, and the definition is the continuous function times the comb function. Uh, here's the continuous function times that uh, comb function written out as delta functions. And you can bring this inside, uh, since it's not dependent on n. And what the delta function does is it sifts out the value of uh, f of x here at these discrete points. So now this is our list. This is our discrete representation of the function f of x. Because this is just a finite list of, of numbers. Or it's actually infinite, but it's, you know, sort of a countable list of numbers. Uh, we can do the same thing. We can define the sample function in the plane. 
and what we get is a two-dimensional list uh, indexed by M&M &M of these values of fxy at the points defined by the separation m delta xy and uh, delta y. So um, we're going to need in a moment the Fourier transform of the comb function so we'll just pause for a second and look at that uh, and recall that the Fourier transform of the comb function or a set of delta functions is itself another set of delta functions in Fourier space. So this is in space in millimeters, this is in cycles per millimeter, and so we get a separation of delta functions in Fourier space. And if we look at what happens when we um, scale the comb function so that we can put our points at arbitrary points n delta x along the x-axis, and so this is the new comb function, the Fourier transform of that um, using the properties of the Fourier transform, particularly scaling property on the uh, dependent variables, uh, we get a comb function in K space that is separated at intervals of 1 over delta x. That's the Fourier transform of the comb function that is separated delta x. We get a comb function where the peaks are separated at 1 over delta x. So this is what it looks like graphically. Here's our comb function, set of delta functions. There's a separation between the points. Let's call this one millimeter, say. And then this uh, is the separation of the peaks in the Fourier transform uh, of that comb function. So it's just another comb function, but now the separations are one over delta x. So if this is one tenth of a millimeter, this is 10 cycles per millimeter, this gap here, okay? So now we can look at what does the Fourier transform of a sampled function look like? So here's our sampled function, g s, g sub s of x. It's the continuous function multiplied by our comb function in the spatial domain. We'll take the Fourier transform of that function and by the convolution uh, theorem you know the the fact that product a product in the spatial domain turns into a convolution in the Fourier domain we see that we get the Fourier transform of little g of x so we'll call it big G of kx convolved with the Fourier transform of the comb function and this is why we needed the Fourier transform of the comb function a few slides ago uh, so the Fourier transform of the comb function is here, right? And again, it's just a set of delta functions separated by 1 over x. And we're going to convolve the continuous true Fourier transform of the continuous little g of x with this uh, comb function. So that convolution can move inside the sum because it's not dependent on n, and so we have the convolution of the continuous Fourier transform uh, with uh, delta x, and that sifts out the values of the continuous Fourier transform so that uh, at each point kx in our Fourier transform of the sampled version of gs of x, at each point we get the value at that point of the pure continuous transform plus the values uh, of that transform separated at units of 1 over delta x. So it's an infinite sum to get any value of the Fourier transform of the sampled version. And so what that means is that if we have uh, a function here, which is the Fourier transform of our continuous function. This is the gkx, and this is our frequency components in that Fourier transform. Uh, when we look at the, the Fourier transform of the sampled version, it isn't just this one thing, it is a whole sequence of versions of this, right? 
and they are replicated at the sampling rate 1 over delta x. So you can see now how it's going to be important what we choose in terms of our sampling period or our sampling frequency. Right? Uh, if we sample with a very uh, small gap between sample points, so delta x is very small, then the separation between these replicants will get very large. It'll move, move away. And any one of those replicants then will be a more accurate representation of the true underlying tra Fourier transform, GKX. In particular, uh, if we know that our Fourier transform, our continuous Fourier transform of g of x as gkx is band limited. That means there are no higher frequencies than u or minus u. Uh, we can then set a criterion for how to sample little g of x such that when we take the Fourier transform of that sampled version, these replicants won't overlap at all. And so here's the continuous you know, value uh, Fourier transform, uh, GKX, we have sampled such that the repeat of uh, GKX, which is part of this, you know, sampled version of the Fourier transform, if the frequencies come down to zero before they overlap, then this representation of the Fourier transform is not corrupted at all by these replicants. And so we can actually write down a very simple criterion. We say, if this is our total bandwidth, let's say we want to sample out here to two cycles per millimeter, right, is our highest spatial frequency that we know is in our object. Then the total bandwidth I have to worry about is minus two to two cycles per millimeter or four cycles per millimeter. So if I set delta x to, or 1 over delta x to 4 cycles per millimeter, right? then I know that these will be separated uh, broadly enough such that they're not going to overlap. And so this central one will be a good representation of the Fourier transform. That's called the Nyquist criterion. And it's quite simple. Our bandwidths, you know, that we want to achieve uh, has to be less than 1 over the sampling distance. Right? This can be called the sampling rate. 1 over delta x can be the sampling rate, say in cycles per millimeter, and this is the bandwidth in cycles per millimeter. If on the other hand we don't make that criterion, then uh, what's going to happen is if 1 over delta x is too small, the replicants move closer to our, our central copy here and we start getting you know additions uh, here so our estimate of the Fourier transform is this plus this which is going to be up here and we'll, we'll get errors in the Fourier transform out at the edges and then as this you know moves in closer and closer eventually we'll see very low frequencies from this part of the uh, first you know, replicant uh, blending in with, with these high frequencies. And we saw that happening with the uh, spinning disk example. In two dimensions, it's the, basically the same thing. Uh, we need, if this is our central uh, set of spatial frequencies in the, in the image on the Fourier space, uh, we need to separate uh, the replicants of the transform in the Fourier plane uh, such that we don't get these overlaps. And if we don't do that, if we undersample in either delta y or we undersample with delta x, then these replicants will move in and we'll start getting corrupted estimates of the Fourier transform. Let's go back to our uh, example that we showed above. You can see now that this sine wave is oversampled actually. It's sampled very well. Uh, we have enough samples across the sine wave to know what the amplitude and phase of this thing is. Um, and the question is, 
if this oscillation is going at one cycle per millimeter, let's ask the question, what sampling rate is the Nyquist frequency? Right? How would you need to sample if this thing is cycling at one full cycle per millimeter? What sampling rate do you need uh, to hit the Nyquist frequency? And at this point, I hope that you can just answer that with common sense. Right? I know it's, it's a little early maybe for common sense, but give it a shot. Give it a try. This is an example of what happens as you go from the adequately sampled condition towards the uh, very undersampled condition. And we're going to move through the Nyquist sampling condition. This is a plane wave, and it has a Kx of 1. Let's call it 1 cycle per millimeter. So every millimeter as I walk along the plane, I go through 1 cycle of a sine wave. My delta x for this diagram is 0.1. So that means I get 10 estimates of that sine wave for every millimeter. So I get a nice smooth you know, function when I'm going along here. It looks like a sine wave. It looks very much like that function. If I drop my sampling rate or I increase my uh, sampling period, delta x, to 0.2, the function looks like this now. It's still a reasonable representation of a sine wave. I have a peak, a trough, and a peak, and they're occurring at the correct position, and everything looks okay. So one assumes I'm adequately sampled with a delta x of 0.2 and a kx of 1. So you can kind of guess where we're going here. Like, what is the Nyquist criterion going to be? Here's 0.3. Delta x is 0.3, or 3 cycles per millimeter is my, approximately, my sampling rate, right? Here's 0.4, so it's 2.5 cycles per millimeter. And here's delta x at 0.5. Recall my wavelength. I have 1 cycle per millimeter. Now I have 1 sample point every half millimeter, or 2 sample points per millimeter. Right? So now... I have a peak and a trough and a peak and a trough and a peak and a trough. And that's perfectly sampling up and down, up and down, up and down. Right? And this, in fact, is where we hit the Nyquist criterion. So it's one cycle per millimeter. My sampling rate has to be two cycles per millimeter in order uh, to represent that sine wave adequately. When I go below the Nyquist, I start seeing interesting patterns that show essentially lower frequencies aliasing back into the representation of this uh, waveform until finally, uh, when I'm at 0.9, right, that's very close to complete overlap of the samples, and I'll talk about that in a second, you see this very low frequency wave, right? The underlying signal that we're sampling here, remember, is this, right? However, it is showing up as this. And the reason is we're just poorly sampled, right? We just, we're, only, we're almost only sampling once per millimeter, right? What happens if we do sample it once per millimeter? Well, we would sample here, 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 here. So everything would be the same value. We would just get a constant, right? And that's complete overlap of those uh, two versions of the Fourier transform in the sense that DC is now overlapping with our highest frequency, right? So in this example, we assume that the highest spatial frequency in the object, let's say, I use a different e example while I was talking about it, but it is one cycle per, per millimeter. Therefore, the smallest spatial period is one millimeter. And the Nyquist theorem says you got to sample with twice that frequency or 0.5 millimeters. So two samples per millimeter. Okay, and there it is.